whites by law uh, were allowed to live in the city of Pretoria where I, I was residing anywhere they chose. Uh, Africans could not buy land or legally uh, live overnight in Pretoria unless they had permission by their white employers. So there was a very rigid uh, physical separation of the residential areas and the, the philosophy was that Africans were only uh, in these areas because they met economic needs of the white population and when they ceased meeting the economic needs of the white population by losing the work. So they had no business, legal business, in Pretoria and could be arrested and they could be uh, deported or exiled back to their alleged homelands in the rural areas of the country. Now, with, for those who were actually legally in the society, all of the facilities, the buses, the restaurants, the hospitals, the schools, were themselves racially segregated as a response to the pressure that that gradually built up worldwide and indeed within the country in opposition to apartheid. A philosophy of separate but equal developed and it would be argued by people invoking that that just as Canadians and Americans have their own country and uh, Canadians can't come down here and vote and move around if they, without the permission of the American government. So in South Africa it was argued that the country known as South Africa was a whites only society and Africans were at best uh, guest workers and when they ceased being guest workers they had to go home. Now the fact was that there was a great unreality to all of that and, and uh, the African population of Pretoria and all of the other so-called white areas increased quite markedly over time until in fact these were statistically more African areas than they were white areas. And so, uh, given that demographic change, the enforcement of uh, this segregation strategy required ever more police oppression. The, the brutality of it became more general as time went on.